Hello and welcome to Security Scan. I'm Vishal Dahiya and this week we will talk about cyber security and defense installations. Now, technology is growing by leaps and bounds with new and improved ways of using data analytics, cloud computing, artificial intelligence and machine learning, etc. The cyberspace is all set to become a very complex domain with threats of a technological nature. And this has added one more dimension to the military operations, the cyber warfare, which involves predicting or protecting assets such as defense installations and critical information infrastructure from cyber attacks and ensure prompt and appropriate response. Now, several critical government agencies have faced varied types of cyber attacks in the recent past. In addition to the existing mechanism, Government of India has uh, set up a defense cyber agency earlier this year, which comprises of officers from the all three armed forces. And the national cyber security strategy is expected to be revealed early next year. For more on this, we're joined by a distinguished panel of guests in the studio today. Let me first introduce the guest to you, beginning with the retired Major General Ravi Arua, the Chief Editor of uh, Indian Military Review. We also have with us uh, retired Lieutenant General Dr. B.K. Saxena, our distinguished fellow from VIF. And we have with us Mr. Sudhir Anjan Sain, the Senior Editor from Hindustan Times. Welcome, all of you gentlemen, to Rajya Sabha TV studios. Let me begin with you, General Arua. And let's first try and look at this issue in a holistic perspective. Let's try and first identify what exactly do we mean when we, uh, you know, say these words, uh, cyber threat, cyber warfare, or cyber security with respect to the defense forces? Uh, let's be clear. You know, we hear often about phishing, hacking, malware, cyber crime. Now, that is a different kettle of fish. I would say that is more or less in the civil, civil domain. Although the methods used may be the same for carrying out cyber warfare, but when we talk of cyber warfare, there are two aspects. One is the defensive aspect and one is the offensive aspect. Defensive is to prevent the adversary from gaining control or information or cultivating spies in our organizations. Offensive is about uh, finding out, identifying these threats, where they emanate from, and attacking them so that they are unable to carry out that cyber warfare. Mm -hmm. Now, we have, uh, we, we do have at the national level, that is under the PMO or under the Cabinet Secretariat, to various agencies, which includes uh, the National Security Council, the uh, NTRO, uh, research and analysis wing, a uh, number of other agencies who are looking after this aspect. And under the MHA also, we have more or less agencies which are identifying these threats, mm -hmm. which includes forensic labs as well, the forensic center, informatic center. And under the Ministry of Defense, we have the newly created Defense Cyber Agency, which will subsume the cyber command cells of the three services and whatever the military intelligence in the Army, Navy and Air Force were running and a few other agencies which were available with a different aim. The aim is not only cyber, it is to assist the armed forces in their operations. Now, War nowadays and the future will be in all domains, mm -hmm. land, sea and air, plus cyberspace and space as well. Mm -hmm. So when you talk of cyberspace, it, this is where the Defense Cyber Agency will come in. Okay. And this includes three domains. One is the cyber domain, one is the physical domain and one is the people, mm -hmm. people domain. Cyber domain, I mean the environment in which the whole thing functions, okay. the software, the applications, the operating systems, and physical or hardware is the actual stuff which we use, the machines, and people, because more often than not, if you have got good defense protocols, uh, good defensive systems, guidelines being followed, then the adversary is going to target people. And mm -hmm. now here I want to remind everybody, we had a case in which the data of the Scorpion submarine was leaked. Again, it was traced to a French subcontractor, 
that means a person mm -hmm. who had actually leaked it. And similarly, there have been other attacks, like one was called the Naval War Room Leak. Mm -hmm. It started with a wing commander's house being raided, a pen drive being recovered, and in the pen drive, a lot of naval data being recovered and became to be known as the Naval War Room Leak. So people were targeted. And that's how the adversary uses these things like honey trap or getting into your smartphones, installing some kind of malware to get information from you, to embarrass you, okay. to blackmail you. So these are all aspects. And in this case, and I will come to it later, China is excelling okay. while keeping everything which they have. Uh, they are denying their own information and obtaining all these secrets. This is where defense cyber comes in. Mm -hmm. Obtaining your secrets related to operations, plans, equipment, design, and about your people. Okay, so, so in, in a nutshell, that's, that's, that's what, uh, you know, the entire concept, entire issue here is. But let me bring in uh, uh, General uh, Saxena here. And, uh, you know, in case of a cyber attack, we have seen, uh, you know, uh, some critical government agencies uh, being, uh, uh, you know, hackers have tried to go ahead and hack their uh, systems or servers and try to, you know, conduct that cyber attack. But in case of defense forces, what is it that is at stake if it, there is a cyber attack? That's a very pertinent question. <clears throat> and to address this, we have to see a macro picture. The macro picture relates to the digital battlefield. Mm -hmm. What is a digital battlefield? In today's scenario, especially in the three services, we have layered command, control, and communication centers. This digital battlefield recognizes no borders, firstly. Also, in this digital battlefield, the attacks are done at the speed of light in the civil domain, in mm -hmm. the cyber domain. As uh, said colloquially, here in the digital field, the victory is achieved not by bullets, but by bits. The agent of warfare is malware, not militia, mm -hmm. and botnet, not the bombs. What is at stake? Let's just imagine. Now, we all know that the command, control, communication computers are a network of systems because of the three services' deep dependence on electromagnetic spectrum. Mm -hmm. Today, there are large number of networks, both horizontally and hierarchically, that means vertically, which relate to command, control, communication, computers, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance and logistics. Now, these networks are all dependent, their, their umbilical cord or their common thread runs in the digital domain, in the cyber domain, which is susceptible to cyber attack. Mm -hmm. That is only one dimension, only one dimension. The other important dimension is critical information which we are storing. This critical information storage can be what? Can be national interest, can be our critical technologies, can be our uh, you know, that uh, codes and uh, regimes of the nuclear war and the nuclear warfare attacks. It can also be decision support system. A critical decision to be taken is dependent on a flow of communication from one commander to some other. Mm -hmm. That is a decision loop. I am not only talking of commander. I may talk of the national command post from where the president or the prime minister or the political head of the nation has to give a critical order, let's say of nuclear retaliation. If that gets blocked at the... At the critical time, you can imagine. Imagine another important thing. Navigation and guidance system of military platforms. What is this? Now you see aircrafts, mm -hmm. you see missiles, you see surface to air missiles, surface to surface missile, ballistic missile. You see a host of unarmed aerial systems. You see the offensive air support our our aircrafts going and intercepting enemy aircraft. All these are dependent, critically dependent on real-time communication, missile guidance, aircraft control, and also fire control in general. Mm -hmm. At the critical moment, if that is disturbed, your aircraft will not chase an interceptor aircraft, your missile will not hit the particular target, your unarmed aerial system will be disabled and will be brought home, your ballistic missile defense system will miss its target. Okay. Imagine the catastrophe. Now, it doesn't stop here. What about, sir, talked about outer space? 
our systems in outer space today are increasing, increasingly vulnerable. We just talked about in a program some time back about the ASAT system, ASAT capability. Mm -hmm. Why are we requiring defense in outer space? Because too much is at stake in the ultimate frontier. Too much is at stake. Okay. Also, one more last point I want to bring out mm -hmm. is that the cyber attack is not only weapons, platforms, communications, layered this thing. It is also in the cognitive domain. What is cognitive domain? Information warfare, propaganda warfare, mind wa brainwashing the soldiers by changing, bringing out a desire, undesirable change in their behavior is also a part of cyber warfare. So this much is at stake. This is the threat to us at the uh, present. Okay, that, that, that's, that's quite a you know uh, interesting sum up, and it's quite uh, a lot out there to uh, think about. But Sudhi, uh, you know, if you look at uh, how. Digital technology is now a very integral part of uh, the entire defense ecosystem, you know, for every country. It's not only about India. So from your perspective, how do you see, uh, you know, these threats which involve either the defense infrastructure installations or the information uh, infrastructure or the entire command structure and other aspects as has been pointed out by both the generals? See, I mean, India has been, although, uh, you know, it's been very, very clever in a way. Because I rarely do I see or come across, do we come across, uh, you know, st structures where, whereby you clearly air gapping your critical systems from your peripheral systems. Now, air gapping is very briefly for our viewers, air gapping is your critical systems are not on the internet. So if you're not on the internet, it's very difficult to get, you know, to hack onto it or get into it. But that said, uh, technology is changing. You have now abilities to jump the air gap. What we recently saw in Kodan Kulam nuclear power plant is because there was an air gap, uh, there was, you know, the damage was limited. And all, whether it is your government, whether it is the military, whether it is, uh, you know, name it, any critical or non-critical, more or less everybody is air gapped. Mm -hmm. So that way we are kind of safe and, and you know, it goes uh, a, a long way to talk about it or it gives an understanding as to how we have been thinking about dealing with this. But that said, you have systems like your air traffic control, mm. like your banking system, which if you can, you know, if you can kind of uh, compromise, you can bring a nation down uh, to its knees. You literally don't need to go and to attack a nuclear system or tinker with a missile guidance system. Mm -hmm. But to bring a nation down to its knees, you can tinker with the banking system, which seems to be our problem. Okay. Because there is a lot of, you know, private, uh, you know, uh, what should I say, enterprise that is needed. Because a private sector may not necessarily think that, you know, cyber security or investing on private, you know, cyber security is worth it. So, so the he, civilian in installations have a lot of private interface. That is why they're more uh, one. So that is that, that. Yeah, because they may not invest as much as is required. Okay. Whereas the threat threat levels are going up. And and from a national security point of view, they are as critical as, as critical. the defense a banking system or a, well. say a, a banking system is the most critical system. It can bring your entire commerce, your country down to your knees. Okay. If I can hack into it. Okay. Uh, going back to the uh, you know entire defense infrastructure and installations and our you know way of looking at things and you mentioned. Uh, uh, General, uh, the China angle and the other angles. Well, there are a lot of adversaries out there. And uh, in the cyber world, it is said that uh, we're just beginning to both realize our potentials as well as uh, the threats. So in terms of threats, we have looked at it how. But the question here is, how are we moving ahead to tackle these threats and where do we stand? Of course, the principle, the theory and everything is well known to everybody. We do have uh, defensive measures. And in uh, theory, you can say, you can uh, predict, you can prevent, you can um, identify, and then you can respond to these threats. But practically, it doesn't happen this way. Now, when you think of China, which is combining cyber war, electronic warfare, information warfare, command and control, and all these aspects into one strategic support system, mm -hmm. Uh, they have done, they have made a lot of progress because after the Kosovo campaign, they realized that information warfare, digitization is going to play a big role. Now, look what they have done. They have their own operating system. They have, they, they don't allow Google in their country. They have the Bidu search engine, their own. Mm -hmm. 
they have control over a number of uh, major domains. You know, these uh, .com and .org and .net, there are 13 of such high-level domains they are called. Mm -hmm. India doesn't own any of them. Even .in and .co.in are subdomains, are considered subdomains. Mm -hmm. USA, Japan, China and some others have got their own full control over it. Uh, so imagine .com, .net or something being shut down one day. Internet is a weapon. China has realized this. And uh, the Chinese, as you saw, mm -hmm. Uh, they, most of their major weapon systems have been developed based on industrial espionage. They find it difficult to target the government labs and uh, government agencies. So what they do is they target the supply chain, mm -hmm. the manufacturers in the civil side who are a bit lax with the cyber uh, uh, guidelines and protection. Okay. And most of these... They have developed an anti-tank guided missile, which is similar to the American Javelin. They have developed the rainbow armed UAV, which is similar to the MQ-1 Reaper. Mm -hmm. They have developed the J-20 stealth fighter, which is similar, which has got many features of uh, F-22 Raptor and F-35. Okay. And a whole lot of such equipment, platforms, weapons they have developed by espionage. You know, the uh, world over, there has been a warning against Huawei and about ZTE. Mm -hmm. ZTE is supposed to be owned by the PLA. And they have a law that all Chinese companies operate, obtaining, uh, operating abroad or in China, when they come across information which is of national security interest to them, they, will, they have to share it with the Chinese government. Mm -hmm. They've uh, used subterfuge, blackmail and a whole lot of things to get sensitive and defense related information okay and they have a very large uh, capacity to launch offensive cyber war dedicated units 13 okay. or 14 dedicated units Ch india is not one of their main targets mm -hmm. but one of these units with uh, is, is against india and a number of other countries grouped together so, so that's the level out there as also far as we look, look at, at the adversaries. how much we depend on now, now we are talking about 5G coming in. Can you imagine by 2025, it is predicted that between 5 billion and 25 billion, depending on whose assessment you go by, mm -hmm. there will be those many 5G devices. Once 5G with Chinese technology is uh, proliferates mm -hmm. and you know around the networks, the in, uh, ecosystem is developed, okay. you cannot do without it. And these 5G devices are not going to be just smartphones. They already have today, today you have cameras, video cameras, they will have night vision cameras, they will have more, cognitive, yeah, more, cognitive more, more software, features they will be used built. with weapons, they, they will have such good broad width, uh, broadband width, they will have high speed internet, they will be able to use armed UAVs with the 5G mm -hmm. and they are going to become a big threat. Have we done anything about it? Not so far. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I hope the Defense Cyber Agency is seized of it, because they are taking baby steps. Uh, soon they will be a full-fledged uh, cyber agency, and I hope they will address these issues. Okay. Jal Saxena, from your viewpoint, you know, uh, agencies like different cyber agencies and looking at uh, you know, the level of these threats and the way uh, technology is uh, developing with every passing moment, you know, the scenarios which uh, uh, Jal Narada pointed out and earlier you also said. So, how do you see things moving ahead in future for India? And for agencies like uh, DCA, the Defense Cyber Agency, for them to adapt themselves or uh, become uh, very, very important in terms of uh, defensive mechanism as well as a, uh, offensive mechanism. Okay, I'll put things in the perspective. Let us start from <clears throat> year 2000 when the Information Technology IT Act came out. It was revised in 2008 and thereafter the National Electronics Policy came out in 2012 and the national cyber security policy came out in 2013. Now, all these policies dealt with the parts of cyber security, means okay. cyber defense mm -hmm. at all times. It was realized that one portion, while cyber security is being built as Sir just brought about in our country also, but what was the main thing which, is, which was missing is to build a credible, 
cyber deterrence. Mm -hmm. What is meant by credible cyber deterrence is to build such offensive and defensive capability that the enemy or your adversary is convinced of not launching a cyber attack because the cost of retaliation will be prohibitive and unacceptable. Mm -hmm. in, this, uh, in this field, very seminal work has been done by Vivekananda International Foundation in which they had a task force. The task force report on credible cyber deterrence in the armed forces of India was presented and one of the major recommendations was the establishment of the defense cyber agency which you see in reality today. It talks about something else. It talks about the creation of cyber power. What is cyber power? Cyber power is the capability and the ability to use the digital space not only for your defense but also to manipulate the cyber uh, space in a fashion which is advantageous to you whether it is surveillance whether it is exploitation whether it is coercion whether it is any act of act attack or defense mm -hmm. it has to be built mm -hmm. now that cyber power is not only just in theory the whole structure of defense cyber agency was laid out in terms of seven pillars of they're, they're called seven pillars of capacity building of okay. cyber power. Okay. Now, it is very, very important to understand those seven pillars because it is where the Indian response is anchored on that because it is the cyber security report which anchored on that. Okay. The first of that is the policy and strategy. Of course, everybody has a policy mm -hmm. and a strategy. Thereafter, the doctrine for cyber power. Mm -hmm. Thereafter, the organizational support which must come for this cyber power. Okay. In addition to that, what are the human resource requirement. How do we require to build the cyber warriors and cyber leaders? Sir talked about the Chinese hacker army. Mm -hmm. How do we build our cyber warriors, cyber leader, perception managers? How do we carry out training in India and abroad and for others? Okay. As also, how do we carry out integration of various concepts which have been developed? How do we do the international interface for, diplo for cyber diplomacy? How do we build a legal framework, a robust legal framework that whenever we take the cyber attack or defense action, the, we are protected internationally, legally and fully by the law. Okay. Those are the seven pillars. Now, Indian response mm -hmm. is, is, is anchored on these seven and the task force report is under implementation and you already see the first step. Okay. So, there is one more important point before I just uh, uh, sum uh -huh. up. Sir, there was a very important high uh, homeland security conference in August 2019, in which uh, in July the government uh, as cyber security in the crime area. They have established a national cyber crime <coughs> coordination center. Mm -hmm. Now, what does it do? It has a seven, seven different elements. It first of all analyzes what the threat is, thereafter investigates, thereafter the forensics which depend on that, okay. and thereafter the response. So the, the response both on the crime side and the response today of the Indian forces is to build the cyber power. Okay, so basically they will have to, you know, work in coordination with yes. each, each other. Uh, Sudhi, yes. from your perspective, uh, how do you see things moving from here onwards and the kind of infrastructure which we have? How do we have to build on that, build on our capabilities to ensure that we are uh, able to go ahead and tackle all those challenges? Well, I would say it's a mixed bag. You know, while there is a lot of awareness that is there within the government, but as governments function and more so, uh, you know, in, in the system that we function, it's quite disparate. There needs to be a lot more focus. You know, in particular, who does, who do you employ or who do you get in to do either your cyber defenses or your cyber offensives? You know, most of these things are being done by 20-year-olds. They are not done by people, uh, you know, who have been trained, regimented in a certain way. Now, you need to make that shift. But ca are you making that shift, mm -hmm. even if the def in the Defense Cyber Agency, I mean, it is, it is a very welcome step. The ca cabinet cleared it last year. It's been, you know, it's taking baby steps as General Arora was putting it out. But you need to think differently. You cannot think in the old ways that, well, I'm going to, you know, bring in 10 men from my, uh, you know, from the signals or from X, Y, and Z, train them. No, you cannot. Because if you look world over, they are being done by different kind of people. So you to improvise. You need to improvise. Okay. Are we doing it? We are, but are we doing it enough? That's a question mark. Okay. So we need to improvise and also ensure that we build on our capabilities. As our panelists have pointed out, uh, there are no borders in the digital battlefield. And with the technology 
growing up by leaps and bounds. We will have to improvise our ways of responding to cyber threats and building on our capabilities to launch a proper response and defend our assets as well. We'll come back again next week with a different topic and different set of guests. Till then, keep watching Rajya Sabha Television.